Welcome again to Industrial Marketing Live. I'm Peyton Warren, a senior strategist at the industrial marketing agency, Gorilla76, and I am one of your IML hosts. Before we jump into our topic today, I want to kick things off again with a quick FYI and an invite. Gorilla76 is collaborating with some killer industrial marketing partners, True Marketing and Kadena's Part Solutions, to host an in-person event called Industrial Marketing Summit. It's happening January 31st through February 2nd in Austin. Uh, we've got a couple gorillas that are local there already, but uh, we would love to see you there. Um, I will be there, Aaron will be there. A lot of folks on this call will be there, so I'm really excited. Uh, you can check out all the information about our speakers and the sessions on the website. It's called industrialmarketingsummit.com. And it's just going to be a great opportunity to learn uh, from practitioners, much like what we do here uh, on IML, but with a few parties and good food mixed in. So should be a great time. Uh, if you've got any questions about it, feel free to give me a shout on LinkedIn or DM me in the Slack channel. Totally happy to answer any questions. Now, back to our scheduled programming. <laughs> so today we have a really great mind joining us, someone I've been really, really uh, happy to meet and, and bump into on LinkedIn and have some conversations with on the side uh, over this whole year, which has been really great. Uh, Victoria Sakal is the head of growth at Wonder. And like I said, she's becoming one of my favorite LinkedIn buddies. I love uh, following her and uh, interacting with her there on that platform and emailing back and forth. But not only is she posting helpful content from her feed, but she also curates a space, uh, a community as well, um, to have conversations that answer those tough questions um, that we have in B2B in really meaningful ways, pulling folks together and um, just facilitating those in, in, in interesting ways that I love. Uh, so if you want to check that out, please do. Um, and really answering tough questions is at the root of what every marketer in this Zoom room is trying to do with the data that we have to work with. At Gorilla, we are a huge proponent of collecting insightful, qualitative data from customer interviews. Um, that voice of customer is something that we've talked about on this show a lot over the years. But there are times when customer interviews are not the answer or maybe not the only answer. And research, the kind you do from your desk, is. So what do we do? <laughs> um, do we just go to Google? Do we commission a very expensive third-party report? I don't know. Let's talk about it. <laughs> let's talk about let's, how do we lower that barrier to entry? Um, and before we jump in, before we dive deeper, Victoria, I would love for you just to say hello. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free, free to add any sort of like color to anything that I said in your intro, or uh, I'd love to hear a little bit more about Wonder too. Just your background, Wonder. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for the intro. I'm super excited to be here um, in part knowing everybody's role here as sort of like the scrappy wear all the hats um, kind of leader of marketing and, and demand gen. Um, that's exactly what I do at, at our company at Wonder. And it's a lot, but it's also where this topic becomes really interesting because uh, you you can't be successful in your role without sort of that feedback loop of either what the audience thinks or feels or what's you know going on in the market and then making your decisions and setting your strategy based on that. But it can feel really inaccessible that there's like you know expensive studies you have to contract or you have to wait a couple months to get things back or there's only so many of the people you're trying to reach and like what are you supposed to do knock on their door every single week with a new question and then eventually they stop answering when you're also trying to sell them things. Um, but I guess by way of a little bit of a, an intro, my background um, has been in the intersection of kind of market research and brand strategy for the last decade or so. So when I think about um, what I was really passionate about at school, it was this intersection of data and numbers and analysis, but also what do you do with that information and working at a big hefty Cantar organization where um, you, know, you would spend a lot of time estimating and scoping big projects and then executing them. And then a couple months later, you'd hand over this big, clunky, beautiful deck that people paid, you know, six figures or more for. Um, it, it was very clear, especially in moving to the West Coast, that there like has to be a quicker, faster, more efficient way that aligns with this whole other band of companies that are not 
not even the fortune 500 they're like the fortune 100 who can afford that slow pace and that that budget um and so in moving to companies like morning consult and then i did a stint at refine labs as well it became really obvious that there's other ways to get especially in the last couple of years there's other ways to get insights and information about our audiences um so now at Wonder, we specifically focus on, as Peyton said, desk research, which is sort of mining all the information that's out there on the public sphere. Um, you know, when you think about the history of like going to the library and having a librarian who would kind of help you find the information, the idea is we're now turning to Google where can be really great for the top five Thai restaurants in your city. It can be really hard to find, you know, the latest sentiments around different trends or who are the top players in X, Y, Z, or who has implemented PLG with, you know, this type of an audience through Google. And now we can also turn to LLMs, but you have to know the right, you know, prompt or invest the time to get the darn thing to tell you what you're actually looking for. You might have to play around with a few different plugins to review reports or, or whatnot. And then you're probably going to have to go verify whatever those LLMs came back to you with. And so Wonder aims to solve all of that. You would interact with our, our question um, and clarification engine, which is sort of a replacement for when you you know call up Cantor, or you call up any of these research firms, you have a conversation around what are you looking to ask? What are you trying to achieve? And why do you need this information so that we can make sure we're getting you the right information? Have you thought about X, Y, Z? Would you want to explore this angle of you know your competitive landscape or your market sizing effort? Um, and then in a matter of minutes, you've got, cool, you know we've got your context. You've explained what you're interested in in learning more about. And then through a combination of a very robust, like multi-LLM chain that we've built, as well as humans who then like go and take the context you've given and give you the answers, you get your answers in hours. So the idea, you know, just to kind of sum that up is when you think about big capital R research being slow, clunky, expensive, it takes a lot of time. There's a whole other end of the spectrum. There's social listening tools. There's other primary research providers, but there's also desk research that can often get you a lot of the way there. Um, and we're moving so quickly and things are changing so quickly that we often um, you know, either forget to do that or think it's only capital R. And so we kind of choose not to invest the time and, and resources, but that's kind of the space we play in. Hopefully that was helpful. Super. Yeah. I, um, I, I think, and we were talking right before we opened up the, the room too, just about that kind of like the fear of like, do I like, I guess like who, who do I really have the authority to say like, this is my research report or are we, do we need to like just rely on these big third party um, services, like, I, I don't know, like Gartner or something else like that, where you're just commissioning something um, and then you trust that. Uh, I guess like to make this into a question, it's like, what is desk research then? I guess, uh, wh like, where do you even start? You know, um, is, is it Google? <laughs> is there somewhere else that you would recommend? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Maybe to even take a step further back, and when we think about like research and all the different types, there's typically primary, secondary, and then um, there's it's, it's called like tertiary. But primary is you're actually talking to your customers, and so that could be social listening, which is behavioral, where you're not actually talking to them, but you're literally watching their behaviors or their searches or, or whatever. Um, that could be survey data where qualitatively or quantitatively you're hearing their words, they're reflecting their sentiments. There's pros and cons there, right? Like, you know, you can ask the question weirdly and people will tell you what you want to hear, but still you're hearing straight from the mouth of the person. Um, you could also consider like product analytics data to be primary in the sense of, again, it's literally what the person is doing and how they're acting in your platform or as they're interfacing with you as a company. Um, call data is another great example of that. So anything that's directly from like the mouth of your audience would be primary. Secondary research or desk research is um, once removed. So it's sort of like a reporting on what you see happening. And so um, it can, the line can start to get a little gray in the sense that a research report published by you know, McKinsey or Forrester, which theoretically talked to primary research or respondents could be considered secondary. But the idea when you commission a firm like Wonder or you go, to, and I, I say commission a firm, which makes it sound like slow and expensive, and that's exactly what we're not. But anyway, 
um, wonder or you go to Google is like, what is publicly available that is kind of more trend and environment and insight related than necessarily, you know, a direct connection to like the, the thing that's giving me the answer is not the consumer. It is like a report summarizing what consumer said, or is it a report what that, you know, summarizes what analysts have found and that kind of a thing. Tertiary is a little bit more complicated. It's more like, um, again, it's once more removed. So it's like if you're buying um, data from somebody else who has, you think about like credit card data, it's not necessarily like you could, you can buy just credit card data from Discover or Visa. It might not be your customers exactly, but it can give you good insights on what's happening. But when you think about this whole space, when we think about ourselves in a role that's trying to move quickly, we only have so many resources, only so much time. Um, there's like the recency of things that really matters. There, how there's the cost and efficiency of commissioning a study versus seeing what's already out there as a starting point. Um, so when we talk desk research, is sort of like anything that's publicly available on the internet. There's also an element of like things that are paywalled, but that that would all still be considered desk research or secondary research as well. So when it comes, it, we're been asking in the chat, and I want to just like vocalize this too. Like, I'd be curious of folks if they have commissioned these reports, what your experience is with those, um, and what sort of information you're trying to seek out. Uh, I think that would be cool uh, just to add to the conversation that we're having here. Oh, yeah, John, John said that he has done some in the past. So John, if you'd be willing to come on and kind of share what your experience was uh, commissioning a third party to help you with research, that'd be interesting for you to share with us. Yeah, sure. So uh, for branding purposes in the past, doing rebrands uh, with companies, I've hired research firms to survey uh, the customer base and potential customer base, both like on a large scale using like phone uh, surveys where they ask them questions and also combine that with in-depth interviews uh, where we you know, pick uh, some subset of the demographic and then do sit down, not sit down like in person, but they're all done on a phone or at least what I've done. Uh, but you have one-on-one -on -one calls where you really like talk to the person, just like you might do in any marketing setting, like you've probably done with your customers or something like that, but at a larger scale uh, using a research company. And the, the things that to me has been the most useful, unless you've done this a lot, trying to write surveys or do research that somebody had said earlier, one of the comments was like, you can't trust the answers or you people give you the answer they think you want to hear or things like that. But if, but working with a professional in my experience helps counteract some of that mm -hmm. nonsense. They're actually really good at figuring out how to ask people the right questions in the right orders. And, uh, you know, so you get the, so you get usable information sometimes i mean i'm sure you've sent out surveys uh and then you get responses and then you might call these people and they didn't even understand the question or they read something into the question or something like that happens all the time um so i mean that's just a tidbit of my experience where i found it helpful and i used a small local research firm it was not expensive you know a few thousand dollars i think we spent like five thousand bucks or something like that on the entire research project and surveyed an, an entire community um, on phone and did something like 100 in-depth interviews. And it, it wasn't that bad. And the information was super valuable for the rebrand. Mm. Yeah, I guess like my question that is floating around in my head is, you know, like what questions are you trying to answer? Um, and I guess, and that starts to point into the direction of like, maybe where you need to go, uh, if the public information on the internet is sufficient or if you need to dig deeper, I guess like that, that's kind of where my brain is simmering at the moment. Yeah. Um, I've got some thoughts there. I don't know if John, if you did, or if that was more directed to, to somebody in general, but, um, I guess if it's a helpful way to think about how we, because we typically work with um, innovators, strategists, or sort of executives in general who, so all to say like not specifically just marketing folks, but a lot of like Mike's example here, market segmentation, size, current trends, like all of that is what those people are also looking for. So when we think about you go 
or almost you work backwards from this idea of like, there's a decision or an action that you need to take um, or a thing you need to launch even from a product capacity that will drive revenue for the business. So you think about that as sort of like launch and commercialization stage. If you work backward, there's a few things that need to happen first. So the, the very first thing is sort of like the business strategy, like what are we trying to do? Where do we play? How do we win? That sort of product marketing fundamentals. Then there's ideation. So are there in the marketing capacity, it could be which are the channels we might want to double down on or like what's a creative way we can resonate or what are the content pillars we might emphasize for a company like Pepsi, it might be what are the new products we release or do we grow into a new territory? Like what are the levers we pull? So ideation. Then there's um, a bit more of like validation. So you kind of double down on some of those, you, you kind of add information around all of those different white space opportunities and you get more information to then prioritize, all right, this feels like the best thing versus, you know, this, this, and this. Uh, and then you develop. So you, you know, do a kind of experiment or, or test the first thing or create a prototype of the product. And then, you know, eventually taking it to commercialization. So the way we think about it is across that full spectrum, you can jump right into primary research, but typically it doesn't hurt. And especially when you can turn to wonder and get a report on your desk in three hours to scan what's out there and get a sense of, you know, what are the trends you might uh, want to tap into or where are eyeballs, you know, for your certain audience already, or, um, you know, what other companies are launching this type of a drink in this type of a market. And that way, when you go to design, either your IDI, you know, one-on-one -on -one interview guide or your focus group or your survey, you're pulling from more of like a, a foundational knowledge base. And the other nice piece there is it's not just like what the rest of your organization thinks to be the case, which everyone kind of, you know, if you're, you have sales teams on the front lines or you have call recordings or, you know, the CEO or founder thinks about the space all the time. It's like, we know all the answers. Like we, we, we know this and just throw this in the survey and like, you know, you do your magic and get some numbers around it. Um, it's a good kind of objective view. So across, when you think about all these different stages that you're going through, whether you're moving so quickly that it all happens in a week or, you know, it's more robust, um, there's a place to start that's usually helpful, which is like the divergent thinking, gather what's out there, see what, you know, you might want to use. And then you can kind of focus it in on either primary research or maybe just move to the next step of the phase because you've got the findings you need. Um, but yeah, desk research is an interesting one because having lived in primary research most of my career where I strongly advocate for talking to the people who are like paying the bills or you're trying to resonate with, um, I also spent a lot of time like Googling and trying to find at least let me sound educated on this questionnaire. So I'm asking our audience things that they actually are thinking about. Um, so there is a, there's a healthy balance between both. Victoria, exactly. have you, have you found, um, you know, a lot of us here on this call are in a lot of like really niche sub industries within manufacturing and, you know, you use Pepsi, but like, you know, Pepsi is talking like consumer, you know, pretty much everybody in America. Right. Uh, have you found that there is, a wealth of information for really niche industries, you know, available, uh, you know, research reports and that sort of thing that we could tap into as manufacturing marketers? Yeah, it's a really good question. Also, when you think about primary research, again, it makes it tough because there's only so many of the people you're trying to focus yeah. or you're trying to reach anyway. Um, for desk research, that's actually where it's been most powerful. There's, um, and, and I'll only give a CPG example because of what I'm about to explain, the like chemicals that they're looking for to understand like the impact on uh, like the viscosity of the product they're producing, like Google is not going to help you with that information. I mean, it will, but like you're going to be on page 15 before you find something credible and helpful. Um, but that's actually where it's like some of this harder to find information or you have to know the right sites. Um, and, and I mean, either you could tell us or like our experts are expert on these different verticals to know like here are the top 15 or 50 reliable sources for information related to category X, Y, Z. Um, because otherwise you spend a lot of time either having to buy reports that you hope are from real experts in the space, or maybe it's like a Forrester report, which tends to be a little too high level and like generally maybe relevant, but not super actionable and practical. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a good, it's a good point in that there's, there's also sort of like triangulations or other threads you can pull that help you get helpful information on the topic or the the category of interest, even if there's not like a perfectly spelled out report on the sub, sub niche of whatever it is that you're focused on.
So to drive this conversation forward a little bit too, um, I, I guess like when it comes to determining the scope of what your research needs to uh, contain, uh, I, I would love if we could talk a little bit more about that. Like um, what I was hearing at the very beginning of this call is this, when you're commissioning like a big research report, business strategies involved. And then my ears perked up and I'm like, great. Like if marketing is involved in these sorts of conversations, we are pulling up a chair at the table and we are saying we want to be involved in the business strategy and we want to support the business strategy. And we want to support the decisions that are being made from the top down, um, which is, I think, a win for every marketer out there uh, at this point. But uh yeah, I guess like when you're determining like what you need to research, um, is that really just like a conversation that you're having internally with a team um, to answer a, spe a specific question um, or or what? I guess like where are, you, where are you starting there? Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe I would, I don't know if there's like a, like rate it on a scale of one to five and drop it in the comments way of, of answering this, but I'd be curious from everybody in the room, like, do you feel like, if somebody at your company or, you know, a customer were to ask you a question about the latest trends in your industry, the latest customer needs, the latest um, dynamics that you could answer any question that there is, that you feel like you have your total head your, or your head totally wrapped around the space that you play in, or is there like, I don't really have time for that. I stay in, you know, the, the execution mode that I'm in, or I'm, I'm okay, but there's like always more I can learn. I guess if you think, if you rate it as like five is like, there's nothing more to know. I know everything there is. And one is the opposite end of the spectrum. I'd be curious um, what, what people would, how they would rate themselves. Um, because what I think most of our type of like thinker and, and contributor where we function is we're probably in like the three range where we have a good gist. We have to have a good, you know, sense of who our audience is and what's going on in the market but there is always more to know. There is always like developments happening or new competitive movements. That's why competitive intelligence is emerging as a category, but staying on top of what's happening and like, you know, reading the really niche newsletters or attending things like this or following the people on LinkedIn and people on like, it's, it's a lot in every day, especially, you know, in certain spaces when things move quickly um, so I guess I go back to, when you think about like where the, where to play, how to win, who you're focusing on within each of those, there's actually just a drumbeat of information that you probably, um, are not like you're sometimes sprinting at to like fill in gaps or like you, you know, you're refreshing, but you're probably not always on in terms of the latest dynamics and trends. And so, um, that's kind of where, when we think about what to focus on, um, and how as I even again in my role as a marketer and working with the rest of the organization, it's sort of like instead of me sitting there Googling and monitoring and setting up Google alerts around, oh, now we play in partially AI. So like my email would blow up if I had that, um, <laughs> you know, going on to try and understand what's happening in my space. The idea is that there's there's like a healthy expertise around the category and the consumer that if we are the voice of the consumer and we are advocating for and we are trying to win with build demand with we need to be that expert and so um again unless you can have the ability or it's really easy and accessible to get on a bunch of customer calls every week send out a survey every other week or once a month even um desk research can be a great thing to like scrape and get once a week like kind of a roundup dossier on your desk of like here's the latest trends here's what people are talking about on social here's whatever um else might complement from that where to play how to win who you're targeting spectrum um and then obviously which kind of part two of your question was like there's the tactical things, again, content, and what should we supplement because what's out there and where's a, a white space, there's very tactical pieces that you could explore as well. Um, but also let me know if I totally missed the, what you're asking. There. No, no, it, it definitely gets, gets at the point. Um, we had another question come in, in the chat from Diane, of uh, just asking for some advice on how folks are contacting the people that they want to survey if they're reaching out just directly um, someone to someone who's already in the network, like Victoria, you mentioned focus group sort of thing, or if there's like cold outreach there, because it's like, so once you're starting to 
you connect, you, you are collecting like your initial, like foundational research so that you have a better understanding. You're asking better questions when you do get to those conversations. But I guess then once you're ready to get to the conversations with the market, um, how are you, how do you suggest reaching out to those sorts of people? Yeah. I love some of the suggestions that came through here, including the ads on like LinkedIn or otherwise, a couple of things that have worked, um, for us here. And then there's also like more budget related options. Um, I have reached out to people over LinkedIn with a message that's explicitly like, I'm not trying to like sell you anything. I actually am just interested, you know, you're an expert in this space. I'm looking to get your feedback on X, Y, Z here, like literally the three questions I want to ask you. And then I might have some questions, but we don't mention that. And, you know, can I have 15 or 30 minutes of your time? here's my Calendly. And then they accept the request because there's no like, you know, pitch slap coming in their way. You follow up with a message and reiterate your calendar. Um, and I've had dozens and dozens of conversations that way, which is also fun because then they're like, so, so no, what do you do? And like, tell me what you do again. And about half of them have turned into pipeline opportunities because like we talked about the space, we obviously had credibility. And then you can also use that for a survey play. Um, you can also obviously just pull from things like Apollo or, you know, whatever your tool of choice is, the contact emails for people. I think the the biggest thing with reaching them, you can show up in their inbox and you can ask them to take a survey. It, the big thing to think about is like, why would they spend time on it? And so there is an incentive or a, you know, gift card or a raffle or something that you typically need to, to consider, uh, which then leads to the other way you can reach respondents is through there's now there's a lot more tools out there. Uh, that have panels. B2B is trickier and, you know, kind of industrial marketing will be an even tighter niche within B2B, but um, they have specialties and they have filters and they have ways of qualifying who are really good respondents in their, what are called panels for anyone who's not familiar with the term, um, where they have like, you know, hundreds or thousands or however many respondents at their disposal and they send out the email, you know, they advise you on the incentive and that's another way to reach people. But um, beyond that, the scrappy piece is like reach out on LinkedIn, tap communities where they are. Um, you can like sometimes drop these, to, I don't know if you're anyone here has a presence on TikTok, but if you can share things like this and um, people will pick it up as long as you have screener questions that get the riffraff from responding to your surveys, uh, you can get pretty creative with how you get it out there as well. Awesome. Great advice. So before I ask that question, you kind of mentioned a little bit about like checking in, um, again and again on these different places where you're, you're listening and like, uh, so I guess my question here is about like maintenance. So like you do this initial, I, I guess one of the downsides of like a really big report, um, that you commission is that you've paid that big, uh, chunk of change, you get a report and you have like a snapshot in time. Um, and if anyone on this call disagrees with that, please let me know in the, in the chat. But I guess that's like that, that's my viewpoint of it. Um, that you have just, like I said, a snapshot of what the, the market looks like right now, but then like markets shift, things change. So I think like, what do we need to think about to keep our finger on the pulse of things? I, I, like, how often should we be, should we be like revisiting these reports um, that we're using to base our entire business strategy on? Uh, yeah, um, this will in part depend because again, I'm, when I think about my role in this AI world, there was, I, I just posted about this this week there was a like point where I was like, we're not even doing research right now because it's going to be obsolete by tomorrow with like people's perceptions of AI and how they're comfortable with using it. Now in some of your spaces, you might be pretty confident saying like, we only need to do this once a quarter. We only need to like commission anything once a quarter and, you know, like a survey format. But I would always advocate for, and there were some such good suggestions on here around like Google alerts or participating in communities or some of the other things we talked about before. That's sort of like a healthy, always on drumbeat. Um, so I would say, you know, it, it's less about you have to be always be doing this at this frequency. And it's more, what is the pace of change in your category? I think competitive movement and activity is something that you probably want to like just see what's happening, get a roundup on a weekly basis. And like, maybe there's two bullets and maybe there's 50, but like, you'll get a sense pretty quickly. Same thing with consumers. If like your buyer is not really changing, maybe you only need to actually 
do a survey once a year, but you probably want to be talking with them regularly. So then when you hit a critical mass of like, ooh, we're hearing trend A, trend B, perception A, perception B, attitude A, you know, enough things that you're like, maybe it's time to do a survey. Um, but all that to say, there's no right answer here. It's more like the pace and the category, uh, pace of the category and consumer dynamics. Aaron, I want to pull you up because uh, Victoria mentioned some of your ideas and I'd love to hear you speak to those a little bit more about what was helpful for you in-house um, whenever you were trying to do your own research. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you're in-house, it's definitely easier to like, because you're focused on just your company, right? So you can like spend a lot more time getting like invested and in staying on top of trends. Like if I subscribe to industry newsletters for all of my clients now, like I would have way too many industry newsletters. But some things that did help me were um, setting up Google alerts, especially around like specific legislation that could help somebody like want to work with you. If that makes sense, like, for example, if there's certain like um, regulations that you help customers fulfill and there's like changes in those regulations, that's really good to stay on top of. Um, also, I mentioned subscribing to industry newsletters. And with those, like, I just would take what was useful and leave what wasn't like you can pretty much tell by the headline if it's worth your time. Um, trade shows. Jared made a funny comment about um, just like shamelessly walking through your competitor's booth and like your full logoed polo and everything like yeah I definitely do that I mean that's like half of like trade shows public information right like it's just cool to see what other people in the industry are doing even if they're not your direct competitor um and I also found that the subject matter experts like people who are managing a product line or something are like visiting customer sites they're like really tuned into specific things happening that I couldn't be like, especially if you have multiple like product lines or like verticals or um, industries that you serve. Sometimes people in your company that are like more focused in on that have a better like pulse on what's happening and can, you know, direct you to good research and resources. Yeah. And I think like everyone's kind of saying like, yeah, shameless marketers unite in the chat. And I totally agree. It's like, if you look at even just like this space as um, a trend in industrial marketing, it's like, we're all willing to help each other um, sort of thing. And if we're all trying to like learn, yes, there is some competitive nature to like certain businesses and they're not going to want to share certain things. I don't know, but you can kind of read the room if you're there. But um, if you have the opportunity to to talk shop with someone, why not take it? I mean, uh it's it's networking at its finest and it's also just an opportunity to get connected with somebody who maybe really understands uh your plight in a way that um a lot of others don't because they're in just a really similar space and we all know how niche some of our markets are so yeah that's pretty cool great ideas brendan what are your thoughts mm. Yeah, I I don't I think like what we talk about a lot is you don't have to go a whole hog into all this, right? Like it can go with baby steps and you know, like don't let this take over your whole work life, but be just keep your radar open. Um is kind of what I'd say. Just kind of just always be listening. And then when you have a specific problem, then go and try and find a solution to it. Um is kind of like I think where I would take this. It's really easy to go and just like spend a lot of money, spend a lot of time doing all of this. And we don't have that as, you know, small manufacturing companies. So I think you have to be really, really focused on what are you trying to actually learn um, before you go out and um, just spend a lot of time. So really focus on what the problem is you're trying to trying to focus on. And uh, and I think like what Aaron said, though, like, you know, maybe be a part of a couple of industry newsletters just to kind of always having some things coming in at you. Um, but like, I wouldn't spend a ton of hours every week, like Googling and trying to find a bunch of research reports that are around your, your business. Um, and like, when we say primary to like, go talk to your salespeople, go talk to your distributors, right? It's not just your customers, right? There's a lot of people like in your industry that you can, that you can chat with, like, is there, um, like a, a trade organization that you can have discussions with, right? Um, so there's a lot of different avenues you can go. 
I would just, yeah, be careful about what's out there. Like do your homework on if that research report actually does answer your questions. I think there's a lot of skepticism in the chat about some of these reports, mm -hmm. right? Like I've been asked to be on reports and it's like, man, I don't have any experience in that. And you tell them that we're like, well, we want to give you $500. It's like, well, that's kind of tempting, mm -hmm. you know? And like, how many people actually do that? So can you trust some of these reports? And like, I remember when I was at Graco, before I started there, they had commissioned a report or some company had sold them a report and they bought it. It was like $5,000 and they get it back. And it's basically like, oh, this is kind of stuff we already knew. And like, so they, and it seemed like they, you, they, they talked to one person in the industry and then got all their information uh, for the report from that one person. So it's like, yeah, what, what are the sources? And, you know, like with my history background, like, it's really easy to say like, oh man, like this historical event happened because of this. Well, it's like, yeah, but the sort, you only had one source, right? You didn't, bring in multiple sources on the secondary research side to say, yeah, this was what actually happened. So I think you just have to be really careful. And it's like the same thing, like, you know, when our parents were out on the internet, like, oh, look at this weird news source, right? It's like, well, yeah. I mean, it's really easy to just go back and like, like look up the information, right? But you can't just take everything at face value. Yeah, and I'd like to get Victoria's take on that too, about sources, like, I guess like, it how can you make sure that the report you are working on passes the smell test? Yeah. Um, because I was just talking to somebody the other day about a, like a 22 year old, you think, Oh, they're so smart and they can get, they'll, they won't fall for all these like phishing and spam attempts. And now we fall for it all the little, time. Little sucker was going to buy Best Buy gift cards, you know, and you're just like, okay, so how do you make sure that you're, um, you know, not, falling prey to just um, bad information, bad data. Yeah. Um, so I guess I think of there's like the one piece of when you do your own research and the second, which I think is what we're talking about, right? The more of the focus, what we're talking about right now is when you're mm -hmm. seeing things publicly, how can you trust and verify what's there? Um, that tends to boil down to like the types of sources. And so again, there's a couple of great comments in here around like work, if it's from an industry organization, you can be pretty damn sure that they talked to the right people and they knew how to find the right people or they knew how to qualify or ask certain questions that only the right people would know how to answer and everybody else would get kicked out of the survey. So there's sort of like the credibility of the institution. Again, um, even again, in the B2C or CPG side, we hear a lot of like, yeah, Forrester is at like this level. They clearly like don't understand enough about our space or the very hyper specific, you know, line of it in order to like actually deliver value in their report. So that's kind of one piece. The other common or someone had said was around sample size. So this is a whole debate as well, especially when there's only so many of our audience or buyer out there. Um, you don't need to have like thousands of people necessarily. Although if you're seeing in a report that they talk to like a thousand people in your space, you probably are going to start to wonder like, what kind of definition do you use of being knowledgeable about this space? Or, you know, are we talking to the right seniority that's interested? So always just check out the methodology. And if they don't have it, there's that typically, and this is where it gets tricky because you're like, well, just take it with a grain of salt. You know, if you see something interesting, but then like go and verify it or run the sentence or the finding by your own audience or by people that you trust to be who you care about as an audience. Um, but then you start to get into that other bucket that I first mentioned, which is when you're doing primary research or surveys or IDIs or, you know, you know, talking to your customers, um, what are the things that you like know they would be knowledgeable about or the types of like boxes they would need to check in order to be a credible source for the information that you're trying to collect. Um, and you'll be the best expert in how, you know, to find that type of information. But um, that is, it's good. There's, you start to get into like some of these research design pieces, but it really isn't that hard when you think about like, if you were to reach out to 15 people on LinkedIn, you would use certain criteria in your head to say, this is someone worth my time to like have an, a conversation with. So just translate that into a survey. Um, I'll also say, um, you know, there's the example of like, a lot of these boutique vendors who will go and do research for you, um, there's the argument to be made that like if you were going to publish this research as thought leadership and have it pay dividends for you, there's the argument that like having a third party do it makes like they almost did it on your behalf. And so you're not like biasing the way the research was designed. Um, 
I obviously am like a, a little skeptical of that in the sense that you can do research well and really unbiased. You know, if you, can, if you open up a report and you see it all over, you know, your branding and your solution, obviously you're biased. If you can do it well, you know, somebody reading it doesn't feel that um, kind of like slimy effect. So that's kind of the other thought that you can always commission. And there are definitely boutique or lean partners that you can tap instead of having to like spend a bunch to, to you know, have that stamp of third party objectivity. This is great. Um, I think that the, the, the one piece I'd like to, I guess, uh, put as a bookend on this conversation is uh, AI, uh, and I know you work at a company that uses a lot of AI, it's an AI company, um, but uh, I, I, I guess like the reason why this conversation even came up is we were talking about um, AI a couple weeks ago on Industrial Marketing Live and how we're using it primarily for content creation and, you know, outlines, different things like that. And Victoria and I were going back and forth about, uh, you know, AI can do more than that, basically. Um, there, and, and so I, I would just like to, I guess, cede the floor to Victoria a little bit to like, because I think that's where the, the question of trust comes up again is like, we kind of are even skeptical to trust it to make like a general outline for us. So I think it's really interesting that like Wonder has built an entire business off of like using AI to do research that we want to trust. So I guess I'd like to hear more just about like, how are y'all leveraging AI and how have you gotten to the point that you feel like you can trust the output um, consistently from what you're getting and also like getting consistent outputs, I guess, because uh, I think that's a, another challenge of using AI tools of any kind. Yeah, uh, the short answer is that we, that is why we have humans in the loop doing and verifying and augmenting every single piece of research that we hand back to clients. Um, but to that end, the way we originally started thinking about this as early as, you know, April or Q1 this year was where can we use AI to either replace humans in some part of the value chain of like, get the question from the client and deliver the answer to them. Um, you know, there are certain ways where we can just like outsource that to AI. Um, there are certain ways where we could use AI to augment the work that we were doing, which could mean accelerate. It could mean like the horsepower of just like scraping all this stuff that our analysts are not then going to have to do. But we basically told it where to scrape and we, you know, we trained it on the right types of sources and otherwise. Um, but that's, and this is what you and I were kind of talking about, Peyton, is that there's like a line where you stop trusting AI, or if you you either don't have an important, it's, it's not a high enough threshold of a decision or an output that you need that you are like fine trusting AI, or you like turn it over to humans and you need the kind of that, that quality stamp. So that's where for us, like you can have a good exchange with um, the art clarification engine. It will, that's where we felt we could replace humans altogether because we trained it on 10 years of conversations our humans had with our clients around scoping projects and clarification questions, yada, yada. So if we replace there and it, like, if we miss certain details, they'll come up in like the first sprint of work that we deliver back to our clients. Or, you know, if the client really cares about, you know, deliver this in a slide deck versus a document form, like they're probably going to mention it. Um, but then when we think about quickly scraping everything that's out there, whether it's atomized insights from our library of research we've already done or across the entire ethos of the internet, um, why not put AI to work on that? And again, we tap all of the LLMs instead of just one. We have built rigorous prompt chains. We're using different plugins. And then our analysts are trained as much on research science. So like the research librarians of the internet, there's best practices for doing research and it's beyond Boolean search. Um, but then there's also training on prompt engineering. There's training on plugins. There's training on all the LLMs so that they're using AI to do their work faster. But they also are starting at like 80% because of everything that that multi-prompt chain handed to them versus zero. And then now it like probably only making it to 80% and what they get back to clients because all of that took them so much time. Um, so that's where when you think about your own work, like even using AI to like scan the category research or the latest competitive trends, it'll probably take you 58% of the way there. And you just need to make sure that you don't feel like you're done. You probably need to verify or like augment some of what it's handed back to you. 
Um, but I would still argue that's better than you starting on your own, only getting to like 30% because you run out of time and it's all accurate, but it's only 30% versus, you know, the 50 or 60 that AI could have helped you get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Speeds up the process, gives you the opportunity to look further and deeper. Um, Super cool. Super cool what you guys are doing. And I, I just really appreciate your uh, your time this morning to chat with us more about research in general and, and thinking about it in new ways beyond just scheduling calls with existing customers. I, I think it's just a really, really, really valuable um, thing that every single marketer can bring to the table if we do a little bit of our own digging and uh, just start, start trying to learn more about our marketplace and uh, yeah. So yeah. thanks, Victoria. I would be curious to hear from anybody because I think the other long tail of this is, you know, you mentioned you get the big report on your desk, maybe once a quarter or whatever it is, you get the thing in your inbox. There's the piece of like, what do you do with it? And how do you connect it to, you know, someone said talking to your sales people are, is a great source of insight. There's listening to sales calls. There's like all of these things now you have in your toolbox for research or for insights. So I'm curious if anybody here has gotten really good at like, mining those or collecting those or making them really accessible for other people in their organization. Cause that's ultimately where the value comes from. Even if you can trust the outputs of any of these things, if you can't act on it or people don't know where to find it, it's kind of like, you know, if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there, does it really fall or make a noise or whatever the expression is. So I'm curious if anybody has cracked that within their own organization or if it's kind of like everyone for themselves with insights. And for me, I would say like, you can use research to get general ideas. Sometimes you're using research to find things out you don't know. And then other times you're using research to measure things that you already know or measure things that you're trying to change. And I think uh, to do the second thing uh, is where you just have to be very specific and very consistent with the questions you're asking, right? So like for instance, net promoter score is very great at uh, measuring like the change in in like a certain sentiment because it's a very simple question you can you can send it out get an answer do a branding campaign or do a CSR campaign or whatever kind of campaign you're doing and then send it out again and get another answer and see if you move the needle or something like that um also like the kind of research i was talking about earlier you can build in some metrics in the research like that uh so say you're doing a brand you're trying to Get, gauge sentiment towards a brand, you ask some very specific questions, you do branding campaigns, and then you ask the exact same questions to the exact same people, and then you look at how the needle moved. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, like that's a different kind of research than research, like what, if, what, what kind of area should we be going into next, or what kind of product is our customer looking for? Uh, and when you do some, a research project, like you have to define, I guess, what you're looking for. And I would always try to put in it some metric component because without it, it's super hard to make sense out of the metrics. You get kind of like a whole bunch of information, uh, but not like clear lines you can usually draw from that information. It's like sentiments, you know, or ideas. Uh, and then you're like, well, okay, we can act on these, but it's not like something you can put on a dashboard. Uh, so you know, the executive team wants to see a dashboard. At some point in time, you're, you want to put a dashboard out there and say, this is what we're doing. And that's just a different type of research that you just have to ask those very specific kinds of questions and ask them over and over and over again. And then you can turn that into a data that you can use to make decisions uh, versus kind of like find things out. I mean, that's my experience. That's super interesting. Anyone else have anything they want to add? I don't want to cut us short if folks have things they'd like to share. Or therapy, if there's challenges that you're grappling <laughs> with and you want to get ideas. From I'll, sign, I'll sign up for that. <laughs> um, I had a question in the chat. And um, so kind of to your last question, but I just haven't had success uh, in turning this stuff into action. Um, no matter if it's from a third party internally, you know, even global organizations paying, you know, Boston consultant group, like just tons of money to show us a bunch of data 
that we already know. Uh, like specifically the last challenge I had was, you know, you do first party research with customers. They give you really real information, um, like the pains that they're having, but it causes but they use words like fires and explosions and, you know, injuries and trying to turn that into uh, actionable ads that resonate is challenging when companies think they can't say anything negative about the situation. Um, so I'm curious if there's any kind of specific resources or specific types of data information studies that you've seen being effective for painting a, a, a picture of the customer that says, hey guys, we need to start talking about this thing more. We can't avoid it. Everybody else in the space is avoiding it. That's why the, the mm. space isn't moving forward. So I just would love your thoughts there. Yeah, is there um, like an openness in your organization to almost like A, B test or like have two different, for example, assets out there in the wild? That's typically, I'm thinking of even work at Refine. Um, we would sometimes throw punchier things out there. And like when the data, obvi they obviously stood out, there was a pattern interrupt. There was like a resonance that led them to perform better than the kind of like neutral version. The data helped tell that story, but I don't know if A, you have the like, you know, reach or volume, but then secondly, the appetite to even do that type of a thing. Yeah. Let's say no, no. let's say you can't, you can't do that. Um, I yeah. think, Peyton. Oh, I was going to say, like, I think you could maybe dance a little bit on the edge of it. And, um, instead of having just like a hundred percent positive, be like, talk about the challenges, um, instead of saying, instead of necessarily talking about the, the problem like head on um but you could get closer to something that maybe is a little bit more spicy or or, or negative um right ultimately I'd, you we all want to get to the point where we're testing it and letting data engagement mm -hmm. data like tell that story but generally uh and honestly i think this is one of the reasons why this space has such trouble is because they're not willing to talk about problems out in the open like this, but you can't even get to that point where you can try. It's like, Oh, well, we can't say that. That's, that's, that's a bad thing. Like that's negative. Like you can't talk about fires. Even yeah. And I every, think every conversation that customer is telling us about a fire that happened that made them make a decision. Yeah. And the other thing there is um, a lot of times I, I get the, the pushback I hear from my clients if we're trying to talk about like how we solved the problem or how we like the problem itself is they're like, well, that's classified, you know, um, like that's like how we actually fixed it is um, we, we don't want to share that. We just want to share that it's fixed, um, but, you know, the happy story at the end. Um, but telling more of that story is going to make you more credible in the end. And so it's like, if you can just like inch closer to sharing more or different angles, and then like Victoria said, test it against something that's more neutral as a baseline and see. Two other right. thoughts I might also try are, so to the testing point, separate from like testing actual assets where you've gone to the trouble of literally designing yada yada, um, to our like survey conversation or like email to your customer base or a group of friendlies or whatever, could you almost create a survey that's like, you know, we're testing, you don't have to do mock-ups, but like you phrase it the right way, but like which of these resonates more, right? So if you literally get survey data that says, you know, which of these like best aligns with something you would say or whatever it is to be like, well, <laughs> this is what people said resonates with them versus this watered down version. But then there's also an interesting play that you could do, especially in like messaging or, or public assets around like almost like um, mad lib, like you purposely don't say the thing that is setting everybody off, like, you know, but the reader who is feeling the pain and like probably is in your space and knows the situation, like they're going to fill in the blank with fire or they're going to fill in the blank with like, or the visual of the, the asset could kind of like allude to what you're talking about. So like, you know, we're not going to talk about the like 
blank that happened last week and blew up your day. We're going to talk about the like, you know, whatever silly example that like has approval to talk about, but almost to, I feel like I've seen ads from some other player that did something like this, where it's like, we're not going to talk about the real elephant in the room. We're going to talk about like some like, you know, quote unquote other issue. Um, But yeah, I'm just trying to think of like how you would get like data or like have the audience's mind do the work to fill in the gap around the problem that the real like language they use to describe the problem, even if you can't explicitly use it. I think another thing you could do is use different kinds of channels for different kinds of messages. So while while you might be tempted to want to say, our products aren't going to kill you on the front page of the website, and everybody might not want you to say that out loud, you could say, our products are, you know, however many times more safe. And then you could you could equip the sales team with information that says, this guy's product killed that guy, and ours doesn't kill anybody. Uh, and they can give that information out more on the DO or just, you know, equip them with that kind of messaging. Uh, I know that this is, this is, this happens. And, and there is an industry that I'm working into that very safety concern. And the, the 800 pound gorilla's main selling point is terrifying everybody else that if you don't use their product, people will die, basically, you know, and it's not true. And they don't come out and say it. They don't say it on their website, but you talk to anybody who's dealt with them and they say, well, this is how they sell a product. Um, so the way they solve that problem is they say their products are safe out loud. And then in, in, in smaller scale communication settings, they say more detailed, <laughs> more detailed like examples of how their products are more safe and their salespeople are equipped to handle those kind of discussions. Like, in those moments. So you could you could take that knowledge, equip the salespeople, and then say something a little more acceptable out loud on your on your website. This is awesome. Uh great advice here and a uh, great question, Victoria, to kind of uh start it all too. And uh I know we're at the top of the hour here, so I'll go ahead and and wrap us for this week. But just again, just wanted to say thank you to Victoria for hopping on uh, today and uh, sharing her expertise. And uh, Victoria, if folks want to get in touch with you, uh, what's the best way? Yeah, I would say LinkedIn. I guess you'll have my name in the email. So that's what I'm under LinkedIn. Um, You can always either message me there and I can shoot you my email or calendar if you want to discuss anything further um, riff on any of this. I'd love to like nerd out about this type of thing and it's a tricky space. So I appreciate the time and hope this was somewhat helpful. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and uh, folks, if you do want to uh, keep uh, the conversation going between now and our next conversation, um, please do join us in Slack. Go ahead and drop a note in the chat and we'll get you invited to that uh, IML community. Our next IML, we're going to be fulfilling a long-standing topic request from Michelle Peak about talking about production quality video content, so really high quality video. Um, we're going to have Nick Tacconi from Gorilla, our own uh, Scorsese, as uh, our clients like to call him, to talk about that whole process and, and what you can do with it. And that's it. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and thanks for hanging out for the folks who stayed to the, to the end here. And uh, we will catch up with you next time. Thanks again.